I tell you, I sure do love the Lord this morning. Uh, No reason at all he should have saved my sorry carcass. He has a 13-year-old boy. I realized I was a sinner on my way to hell, and I called on him and saved me. Amen. Yesterday, Lance was out weed eating, and uh, I was out there weed eating. He got to thinking about some preaching he heard. And he came inside and he came back to my room, knocked on the door. He said, "Hey, Daddy," and he talked to me about something. I said, "All right." I opened the door and he said, uh, "I need to get saved." Now this is terrible on, on my part. My first thought was, "This boy's trying to get out of weed eating." And I said, do what? He said, I need to get saved. I said, are you serious? He said, yes, sir. So we sat down and began to talk, and he uh, said, why do you need to get saved? He said, so I can go to heaven. I don't want to go to hell. And, uh, I mean, that's a pretty good reason. He said, I'm a sinner. And uh, I said, I was five years old. I made that profession, Daddy, but I didn't know what in the world I was doing. And uh, I know I need to be saved. And. And he asked the Lord to save him. And uh, he prayed. I didn't help him pray. He just prayed on his own. Lord, I've done all kinds of sins and this, that, and the other. Got saved. And when it's all done, I said, man, that's great. You died where are you going? Heaven. Who are you trusting? Jesus. I said, all right, now let's go back to my room and get the stick. We need to talk about all these sins you say you've been committing. (laughs) Yeah, what you've been doing. Talking about lying. I said, what lies did you tell? Later he came to me and said, Dad, I'm sorry for all the lies I told you. I said, really, you want to tell me what they are? He said, you really want to know? Nah, <laughs> I probably don't. But praise God, I, I, I'm glad I'm serving a good God. All, all the rest of that evening, he, not the rest of it, but a good bit, he walked through the house singing that song the tour group sang, I'm not going to hell. And, uh, well, I have a good God. He's real. Folks, I, I don't come here uh, just because this is what I do. I, I, I come here because I'm serious about this thing. I'm serious about this thing of living for God. I don't always do it right. I, I fail. I make mistakes. and uh, Not as bad as the one Lance has been making for 13 years. But I fail and make mistakes. But I'm serious about it. I can honestly say that Jesus Christ is the best friend I have. Now, as far as people here, right, right here walking around, my wife is. But over her, even, Jesus Christ is the dearest friend I have. And, uh, you know, we say amen. But if he's a dear friend, let me ask you, have you spent some time with him this week? I mean, have, have you spent time with him? You know, there's no way that you'll be able to grow in the Lord if you're not spending time with him. Uh, well, preacher, that's why I come to church to hear you preach. Well, listen, man, I'm not Jesus. I'm the pastor, and God sent me here to to lead. But, man, you've got to spend time with him. Spend time with him. I mean, there needs to be a time every day that you get alone with him. When's the last time you got alone with Jesus and just looked up and said, Jesus, I'm not here to ask for a single thing. I just want to tell you that I love you. When's the last time you just talked to him about all the good things, all the blessings in your life? When's the last time you thanked him? I mean thanked him all, all alone, God alone, and thanked him for saving you and for pulling you out of that deep pit you were in and setting your feet on a solid rock. When's the last time you got alone and just thanked him? Hey, when's the last time you got alone and thanked him for that spouse that puts up with your junk? When's the last time you got alone and, and thanked him for those parents for your children. Well, we, we, we miss the mark, Christians, in thinking that we're, we're Christians just because we know how to dress. Look, some of you have a tie on. A, Brother Steve has a tie. Always looks sharp. Man, got them shined up boots. Man, that about get you to heaven right there just wearing them boots. Look, you know what? That tie, Brother Steve, and you know this already, these ties, that don't make me any closer to God. Spend time with him. Got to walk with him. Psalm 61. Let's read this. I'll read it. You read it silently. I'll read it aloud. Hear my cry, O God. Attend unto my prayer. 
From the end of the earth will I cry unto thee when my heart is overwhelmed. Lead me to the rock that is higher than I. For thou hast been a shelter for me and a strong tower from the enemy. I will abide in thy tabernacle forever. I will trust in the covert of thy wings, Selah. For thou, O God, hast heard my vows. Thou hast given me the heritage of those that fear thy name. Thou wilt prolong the king's life and his years as many generations. He shall abide before God forever. O prepare mercy and truth which may preserve him. So will I sing praise unto thy name forever, that I may daily perform my vows. This psalm was written by David. Many believe it was during the time that he had fled from Absalom, his son. His son Absalom had gathered an army. The Bible tells us he had stolen the hearts of the men of Israel. He had gone to Hebron and and taken some with him, and there they declared him king instead of his father. And he comes back to Jerusalem with a host of men with him. David gets word that his son Absalom is coming back, and rather than causing a civil war and gathering his army to fight the army that Absalom has, and rather than killing his son, David packs up tent, and he he takes off out into the wilderness, and he he just gives it over to his son. I I don't want to fight my son. Not only did his son rebel against him and betray him, but Joab, man, his trusted general for years, He had led David's armies into battle for years. Man, he had put his life on the line for the king, and the king had done the same for Joab. And now Joab joins the rebellion with Absalom against David. A wise counselor, Ahithophel, Oh, for years as they would go into battle, David would talk with Ahithophel and and ask, what strategy do you think we need to use? And boy, Ahithophel would guide him in in the affairs of war and in the affairs of the state and, and, and anything to do with the kingdom. Oh, a wise, wise, trusted counselor. And he hears that Ahithophel has joined Absalom in the rebellion. Not only did his son and his trusted general and his advisor betray him, but we see that hundreds of of the men of Israel had also joined Absalom. Their hearts had been stolen by Absalom. Now the king finds himself in a position that he was acquainted with from years ago when running from Saul. Now he's in the wilderness. No longer in the palace. He's in the wilderness. He's hiding in the caves. He's hiding in the trenches. He's hiding in the forest. No doubt, David experienced a wide variety of emotions. No doubt, there was a little bit of fear in David as he ran. No doubt, there was some heartbreak as he thought, Man, this is is my son. This is my son. And he, he's, he's out to kill me and he's, he's overthrowing my rule. No doubt there was some regrets. Maybe as David's out in the trench or in a cave, he's thinking, boy, what did I do wrong? Boy, I know I should have spent more time with him. I was so busy ruling this kingdom and doing this work that I neglected that boy and I didn't take the time to teach him. I left him with some other teachers and, and I didn't teach him. I didn't teach him how to serve God. And I didn't teach him how to love God. And surely David probably began to beat himself up over that. Sure, he experienced some confusion out there. What, Joab? My general, he's fought with me. Now he's fighting against me. I don't understand. I hit the fail. He's advising my son now. No doubt there was regret. No doubt there were doubts. No doubt there was disgust. No doubt he experienced anger. No doubt even with his his army around him and he still had some advisors and, and some men that were faithful to him. Even then, he may have felt lonely. You ever felt lonely in the middle of a big crowd? No doubt he, there's a good chance he felt some hopelessness in a situation. Listen to what he says in verse number one. Hear my cry, O God. In verse number two he says, when my heart is overwhelmed. 
When it, when it, hey, look, Lord, things are dark. I can't see what to do. I can't see which way to go. I, I have no idea which way to turn. It, it seems hopeless. God, my heart is overwhelmed. I, I, I cannot handle anymore. God, I'm at my wit's end. I, I, I'm about ready to throw in the towel. God, you've got to help me here. This is more than I can handle. And what does he do? He cries out to God. Several things he asks of God here. He says, hear me. God, I'm, I'm out in the wilderness again. I'm not in Jerusalem, that holy city. I'm no longer in the palace. I can't go to the tabernacle or the temple. God, I'm out here in the wilderness. Oh, hey, God, would you hear me? It's a desperate plea of one who's overwhelmed. He's unable to see any light, unable to receive any comfort. Surely the men that were with him, they'd say, hey, David, we're still for you, but that was very little comfort knowing that his own son had gone against him. David, we're still for you, yeah, but Joab, my trusted general for years, is against me. David, we're still for you, yeah, but it hit the fail. Man, he was, he was like a brother to me. He's against me. In Psalm 61, verse 2, he says this, From the ends of the earth will I cry unto thee. When my heart is overwhelmed, lead me to the rock that is higher than I. Let me ask you something. Are, are, are you overwhelmed? If you're not, then I'm sure you have been before. And if you haven't been before, you're going to be someday. This old world is not an easy place. But I thank God that we have a great God that when our heart is overwhelmed, we can call unto him. I think of Miss Thurston right now and refer to her very much because, boy, what a testimony they are and what a battle she's fighting against pancreatic cancer and hasn't been able to come to church in, what, over a month now, I guess. She has good days and bad days. Some days she, she experiences a lot of pain and a lot of weakness. Hospice is at the house now and they, they work with her physical therapy and, and, they, and they try and I, I, I go and talk to Brother Thurston and, and he has this intercom wherever he's at he can hear her when she's in her room and he said preacher sometimes I just sit here and listen to her breathe he said sometimes I sit here and listen to her pray boy his eyes will glass up and nine out of ten times he'll say but preacher, God's been so good to us. Preacher, he's answered so many prayers in this. Preacher, we've seen so many miracles in the midst of this. They've learned to cry out to God. He said, from the ends of the earth, Lord, I'm in a dark place. I'm in an unfamiliar territory. God, I've not experienced this. Yeah, I ran from Saul and he was my leader, but boy, never have I had to run from my son. Never, Lord, have I experienced this type of uh, betrayal. Father, I feel like I'm, I'm separated. I'm isolated. I'm on the other. I feel like I'm on the other side of the world. Oh, God, would you hear me? You ever felt that way? Now, if you haven't, you're going to one day. Preacher, thanks for the encouragement. Well, the encouraging news is this. You can call on God and he'll hear you. He cried to the one that would answer him. He cried to the one that would hear him. Listen, Psalm 145, 19. He will fulfill, fulfill the desire of them that fear him. He also will hear their cry and will save them. You ever get to feel like nobody cares? I get to feeling that way. I, I, sometimes I get to feeling that, that like that. Uh, uh, nobody likes me. Everybody hates me. I think I'll just eat worms and die. I mean, nobody cares what I'm going to. Nobody can understand. But he says right here, he will hear their cry and he will save them. Isaiah chapter 41, 17, listen to this. When the poor and needy seek water. Hey, have you ever been poor and needy? I'm talking not necessarily just financially. I'm talking about in your spirit. They seek water. You ever thirsted for God? It says when they, when, they, when they seek water and there is none and their tongue faileth for thirst, God, I, I've got to have something for, from you. This is, this is a dry time in my life. I've got to have something from you. God, I'm getting weak. I'm getting worn out. I, I don't think I can go much further. Oh, God, I've got to have something. Listen to this. I 
the Lord will hear them. I, the God of Israel, will not forsake them. David, the Bible speaks how that, and, and the Psalms he writes how that, boy, uh, uh, Lord, my heart panted after you like the heart pants after the, the water brooks. That deer running from the dogs, running from the prey, running from the hunters, and boy, I'll run and get t- tired and, and pant and say, boy, if I could just have some water. And David said, Lord, that's how I feel. I just want to get close to you. God, I need your presence. He cried unto God. Isaiah 65, 24, And it shall come to pass that before they call, I will answer. And while they are yet speaking, I will hear. Do you hear how willing God is to hear you when you call out? He said, hey, sometimes before Tyler, before the prayer ever leaves your mouth, boy, God knows your need, and he's already in the process of answering it. Because it's sometimes, Tyler, while you're in the midst of praying it, I'm already hearing, I'm already dispatching angels, I'm already working in your life. You just don't even realize it, Tyler, because God says, I'm intimately caring and involved about you. Well, he'll hear you if you'll cry to him. I mentioned last week, Brother Rouse pointed out a verse. Exodus 32.10. God says to Moses, Moses, get up from among these people. I'm going to destroy him. Moses, I'll start, I'll start a new nation from you. What a tempting offer. But Moses remains on his face before God, between God and the people, and said, oh, no, God. Oh, no, God, don't do it. You delivered these people. Well, the kingdoms of the earth don't make a mockery. They'll say that you just brought them out here to die. No, 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 don't do it, God. And God said, Moses, would you leave me alone and let me do it? And Moses stayed there on his face between God and the people. Said, no, God, please, listen to me. Don't do it. These are my people. These are your people. I love them. You promised them. Stay true to your word. He sought God to the point that God said, okay, okay, leave me alone. When's the last time you sought God that earnestly? When's the last time that you that earnestly said, Oh, God, I need your presence in my life. God, I want to be used by you. God, my co-workers, my classmates, there's some of them that are lost without Christ. They're on their way to hell. Oh, God, I need you to fill me with your Holy Spirit and give me the boldness to tell them about Christ so that they can come to know Christ as Savior. Oh, God, and when's the last time that you besought God to the point they said, Okay, 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 I'll do it. When's the last time you cried out to God with your heart? You know, we have a a strange habit of trying to fix our problems ourselves. Now, I'm, I'm 43. I'm younger than some and older than some. I'm right here in the middle. But in my 43 short years, I've learned this. When I try to fix it, it don't work. I, I, I'm terrible at fixing stuff. I can't fix anything, man. I can tear If you need something tore up, you call me. I am your man. If there's a sledgehammer or a chainsaw or something involved, a, 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 a bulldozer, a wrecking ball, whatever it is, you let me know. I'm your man. I can do it hastily. But if you need something fixed, you better call Brother Steve. You better call Brother Minahan. Man, me and my dad and my brother-in-law, one time we decided on this building behind our house when I was living there in Gastonia outside of Charlotte. We decided we need a, we got a bigger mower, so I need to, to make a bigger doorway. And so we took the single door off and I said, okay, we're going to make it big. We're going to make double doors and make it bigger. Man, when it was done, how many of you remember that show, The Adams Family? It looked like something from the Adams. But man, them doors were crooked. There were gaps everywhere. It looked awful. I found that when I try to fix my problems, I make bigger problems. But if I call out to him and say, now, Lord, I'm in a mess here. 
and I think I know what to do, but in the past, I've made bigger messes, but you've never forsook me. God, you've never let me down, so Lord, I need you. Not only did David say, he would, did he say, hear me, God? But he said, Lord, I need you to lead me. If we look there in, in verse number somewhere, verse number two, he says, lead me to the rock that is higher than I. That rock he's talking about for us is Jesus Christ. Listen, in this life, if I'm going to make it and I'm going to bring glory to God, then I must find myself grounded on Him, anchored to Him, rooted to Him, or else I will be destroyed by the storm that is around me. Psalm chapter 40, verse 2, He brought me up also out of a horrible pit, David said, out of the miry clay, and He set my feet upon a rock and established, man, he, he made them firm. He made them grounded. He made them stable. He established my goings. When were they established, David? When he set my feet on that rock rather than that miry clay and that shifting sand. Jesus speaks and he tells the story. He says there's a rich man <clears throat> going to build a house. And boy, that first rich man, he built his house upon the sand. Boy, the rains came and the wind blew and that sandy foundation, it washed out from under that house and great was the fall of it. He said, oh, but there was another man. That man, he found a large rock, a firm foundation, and he built his house upon that rock. And when the storms came and the rains fell and the winds blew, that house did not fall. It stood for it was built upon a rock. And if you want your life to withstand the storms of this world, you better make sure that it is built on the rock of Jesus Christ. Not the rock of your opinion. That's not a rock. Well, I'll tell you what I think. You know, I think that we sometimes we think too much about the wrong stuff and not enough about the right stuff. Hey, won't you just give it to Jesus? In Psalm chapter, or from time to time, we get to feeling self-sufficient, don't we? When things are going good, you ever notice that? When things are going bad, boy, we call on the Lord, we lean on Him. Then th when things start going good, well, look at how good I'm doing. That reminds me of when my oldest son, Chad, is in a Taekwondo tournament. And boy, he was fighting this guy that was a little bigger than him, a little bit, uh, uh, a belt higher than him. And he was doing pretty good. He'd get in there and he'd, he'd get in and jab a few and make, throw a few kicks. He got back. He started thinking, boy, I'm doing good. Brother Hunt, he thought, I'm doing good. And he stepped back, and he rested his arms a minute. And then he went back to the fighting, but see, he thought he was doing so good, he forgot to do something. He forgot to put his arms back up. We watched this in slow motion. We had a videotape. Here's how he went back in. No lie, I mean... That's exactly, man, that, that guy's bigger than him, a belt higher than him, did a jump, spin, and back kick. I'm standing down there next to the mat. I thought, this ain't going to be good. Man, he kicked my son right there on that jawline. Here was Chad's evasive maneuvers. I mean, as soon as contact was made, I thought, he's out. Son, he fell flat. Boom. I thought, poor guy, but that was a beautiful kick. <laughs> it really was. My wife's sitting up in the bleachers. The other lady say to her, I can't believe you're just sitting there. I can't believe you're not running down there. She said, what is it you said? I've, yeah, I'm not allowed. <laughs> Son, he got his... his his instructor was from South Korea. He came over and he said, Chad, get up. Get up. The other guy's counting him out. He's on about five or six. Chad sits up and does like this, and he starts to get up, and he said, no, stay down. <laughs> know what had happened? Boy, he was doing good. Boy, he had his guard up, and boy, he was, he was jabbing, he was kicking, and, and then he, he, he got feeling good. He let his arms down, and he went. I know we watched. Hey, I did it frame by frame. 
Look at this, son. Dad, really? Yeah, man, that's a beautiful kick, isn't it? You know what happened? He became self-sufficient. When we become self-sufficient, well, I can do this. I can overcome. I'm able. Well, what? You've never been able to before. You had to have God's help. He said, Lord, here I am again. Out in the desert again. I'm in the caves again. I'm in the trenches again. Somebody that I love is trying to kill me again. I don't know where to go. But Lord, you led me when Saul was trying to kill me. You led me. You told me where to go. You told me which caves to go to. You told me which mountain to go to. You told me which towns to go to and which forest. So God, here's what I need you to do. Lead me by your presence. First Corinthians chapter 10 verse 4 speaks of that rock. It says, and did all drink that same spiritual drink, for they drank of that spiritual rock and followed, that followed them, and that rock was Christ. When David says, lead me to the rock that is higher than I, I'm talking about the Lord. Oh, your wisdom is higher than mine. Your thoughts are higher than mine. Everything about you, you're higher than I am. Lead me to your presence. I want to follow you. Hey, let me tell you something, teenager. One of the greatest days in your life will be when you stop following the crowd and start following Christ. And I want to tell you something, Timmy. It takes a man with a backbone like a saw log to follow Christ. Any old wimp, fellas, any old wimp can get out there and do what the rest of the crowd's doing. Any of them can. Any of them can. Anybody can go out there and do wrong. Anybody can. Oh, but it takes a real man and a real lady with some guts and a backbone to stand up and say, hey, I tell you what, like Joshua said, hey, y'all go and do your thing, but as for me and my house, we will serve God. If we're the only ones, we're going to serve him. I'm going to follow him got some guys here today that play football for the Mount Olive Middle School. Oh, Marcus, I, I'm, if I get enough money, Marcus and, and, and Donald, I'm going to hire y'all to be my bodyguards, man. These two guys play the, the line, they're linemen. I bet you couldn't tell that, could you? Oh, Marcus, he looks more like a wide receiver, doesn't he? Man, these two guys are bigger than I am. You see them out there on the field? I mean, they... Already, when they got them pads and that helmet on, they already look like NFL players. They're middle school. How old are you? 13, how old are you? Lord have mercy. I mean, them some grain-fed boys right there. Big old guys. Hey, I've seen them do some tackles and end up on top of several people. And immediately, I want to take a knee and start praying, God, help them people on the bottom. Let, let those big guys get up quick. Those guys can't breathe down there. I saw Donald hit somebody this past week. And I thought, oh, there's a hospital visit. Hey, let me tell you something, guys. The greatest thing you could do is follow Christ. Hey, I, I believe this, fellas. I believe if y'all follow Christ and not follow the crowd, I believe you could change your whole school. Now, I believe that. I'm not saying jump up on a table and start praying. Please don't jump up on a table. Okay. You have to be paying for a table. Hey, I believe if y'all just follow Christ, and some of that school will start following you. I believe it. Here's the thing. Two things. Number one, do you love Christ enough? Number two, are you man enough to do it? He said, Lord! Hear me, I'm crying to you. Lord, now I need you to lead me. I don't know which way to go. I need you to lead me. Boy, there's an impossible task. I want to reach my school for Christ. And I want to reach my workplace for Christ. And I want to reach my community for Christ. But I don't know how to do it. It's an impossible task. Lead me. So he cries out and he says, hear me. He cries out and he says, lead me. Another thing he says to lead. Is in the fellowship, he says, if we, oh, 
And truly, 1 John chapter 1 and verse number 3, that which we have seen and heard declare we unto you that ye also may have fellowship with us. And truly, our fellowship is with the Father and with His Son, Jesus Christ. Lord, not only lead me where to go and what to do, but Lord, lead me into your presence. Do you realize that when you call out to God, you are entering into the very presence of God? You're entering into that holiest of holies when you call out to God. Lord, lead me to your presence. I want, I don't, if, if I can't have your presence, I just don't want to be around. Not just in fellowship with him, but with others. But if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship one with another. Hey, look here. You know, the purpose of the church is not just to get together and hear some preaching. That's not just the purpose. The purpose is, Tyler, because I need you. Because you need me. And you need Brother Condor back here, and he needs you. And because Amanda, uh, uh, Lauren back here needs you, and you need her. Man, we've been out there fighting the world. I'm, Lord, I'm following you, but man, it's getting tough. There's enemies all around me. Boy, he brings us into fellowship with other Christians. Boy, to encourage each other. Hey, folks, it, it amazes me how, how people bounce around from churches to church to church to church. I, I don't understand that because that's not my concept of church. The concept of church is that's my. Hey, listen, you're my family. You're my family. This is my biological immediate family, but but you're my family. Boy, George, I love you just like a brother. Matthew, I love you just like one of my pets. No, I'm kidding. (laughs) I'm kidding, brother. I'm teasing. I love you like a brother. I mean it. You men, you're like brothers to me. I don't say that lightly. I mean it. Lady, and that's why I call you brother. Ladies, you're like, you're like sisters to me. i got to have you. If I wasn't the pastor, I'd still need you. Why would you need us, preacher? Because I'm out here trying to, trying to win the world to Christ. And, and look, I'm not a preacher that just stays in my office all the time. I, I get, look, I get out in the world. I went to dance the other day. No, I didn't do that. Hell, I, I get out amongst the world trying to take the gospel to them. I, I, I try to get into public schools. I, I, I go preach to the, the, in the senior, citizen, uh, senior citizen center. That's a wicked crowd. <laughs> Miss Edna and Brother GL, I leave out of there feeling filthy. Hey, look, but I come here, I come here, and boy, I, I get to hear you say your praises to God. We get to sing together and encourage each other. Why? So that we can go back out and try to win the world to Christ again. Lead into that fellowship. Hey, here, here's, here's real quick. Then he says, Lord, hear me. I need you to lead me. Lord, I need you to protect me. My life's in danger. I'm in peril. Father, I need you to protect me. You know what a shelter is? He said, I I need you to be a shelter from the storm. A shelter provides protection from the outside elements. This whole world, many times in the Bible, uh, it compares this life and this world to living in a storm. What does a shelter do? It protects you from the wind, from the rain, from the cold, from the heat. It provides warmth when it's cold. It provides shelter when it's when the, uh, um, when it's stormy. He said, "Lord, I need you to be a strong tower from the enemy." That tower provides protection from the enemy. 
It was a type of place that could not be easily overcome by the enemy. Many times it was built maybe on the side of a cliff or in a mountainous area. There were battlements where people could stand on the top and, 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 and fire their weapons down at the enemies. It was made of stone. It was very hard to overcome. Within the fortress would be all that those seeking refuge would need to overcome the enemy. Preacher, I feel like I'm about to be overcome. Then run to Jesus. He speaks. Listen, this is Matthew 23, 37. He said, O Jerusalem, Jerusalem, thou that killest the prophets and stonest them which were, uh, are sent unto thee, how often would I have gathered thy children together, even as a hen gathereth her chickens under her wings, and you would not. Oh, hen, boy, if there's trouble, she'll open them wings and them little chicks will come up under there. And, boy, she'll sit down and she'll cover those chicks over. Other than them chirping, you can't even tell they're there. What's she doing? She's, she's putting her life on the line to protect them chicks. Christ says, that's what I'll do. He said, hey, come up close to me. Whenever one of my boys, I have five sons, many of you know that, whenever they were little, if they were scared, you know what they do? Run right up next to me. Put the death lock on my leg. Jump up in my arms, about choke the life out of me, holding on. I remember the first time we went to Tweetsie Railroad. Anybody here ever been to Tweetsie Railroad? I love Tweetsie Railroad. We got on there, on the, on the train. Chad had him a little toy gun and a cowboy hat. And I didn't tell him what was about to happen. See, that train stops at one spot, and the Indians sneak up on the train. When you're watching what's going the show out here, they sneak up on the train. Next thing you know, they're running down the aisle. Oh, whoa, 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 whoa. Son, Chad was all watching them cowboys, the, the good ones and the bad ones. The bad ones trying to take the strong box from the sheriff. And, them. and he's watching, boy, they're shooting. And, and all of a sudden, oh, whoa, 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 whoa. And here comes an Indian running down that. And, man, he jumped up on me, put his arms and legs around me, squeezed me, and his, he was shaking. I mean, violently. What did you do, preacher? I laughed. <laughs> Is that bad? I laughed so hard. He was in danger. You know what he did? He got as close to the protector as he could. He knew daddy was going to protect him or die trying. He, he didn't, wasn't planning on daddy laughing at him. But <laughs> the Lord won't do that to you. Hey, look, you, you feel overwhelmed? Then get up close to Jesus. I mean, get up close to him. Then the last thing, he says, tune me. He says, he hath put a new song in my mouth. Even praise unto our God. Many shall see it in fear and shall trust in the Lord. You know, as good as God is to us, just a couple things he expects. He wants us to be thankful and he wants us to never forget. I love that, that old hymn. It says, come thou fount of every blessing. Tune my heart to sing thy grace. Streams of mercy never ceasing. Call for songs of loudest praise. Says, oh, as good as you've been to me, God, I've just got to sing. I've just got to, I've got to tell somebody how good you've been. I just want to praise you publicly. Psalm 108, verse 3, I will praise thee, O Lord, among the people. I will sing praises unto thee among the nations. Psalm 40, verse 3, and he hath put a new song in my mouth. Even praise unto our God, many shall see it and fear and shall trust in the Lord. Lord. I want to be close to you. Hear me. I need you to protect me. I need you to lead me. Father, I want you to work in my heart and tune this heart to praise you so that others know how good a God you are. Oh, man, when we, when we have opportunity to sing, when Brother Perry says, okay, stand and sing, and I'm going to slow it down, and we know he's going to slow it down. Somewhere in the middle. Not yet, brother. I was talking about you, not to you. That was kind of spooky. (laughs) 
I'll say it again in a minute and you can come in. Boy, this church is something else, isn't it? Sarah's, uh, is it Jared? Jared? I'm sorry, brother. <laughs> hey, look here. He says, everybody stand, get a hymn book and sing. Man, you ought to get this hymn book. You ought to just belt it out. Man, I don't care what it sounds like. Make a joyful noise. I don't care. He lives. I don't care if it's, I serve a risen Savior. I remember when I first started attending Liberty Baptist Church in, in Charlotte, my wife's daddy was in the choir. I forget the song. What was it? Do you remember? He wrote my name. You know that song? He wrote my name way up in glory. He saved my soul from sin and shame. Well, in that song, it's, he wrote my name, and, and the sopranos, and everybody else say, my name way up, way up in glory. And, and the, they're singing, you know, the echo. He couldn't. They'd say, he wrote my name. My name! Way up! <laughs> up in glory land! I'm not joking. Had this tall, black guy named Cleveland. He's about 6'3", I guess 6'4", and... He is a teenager, rode our buses. He got in the choir. Y'all know that song, Beautiful Home of Purity Light. Be- He'd never sing beautiful. He'd say, Brutiful Home of Purity Light. Brutiful, brutiful home. You know what they were doing? They were praising God. You see, her daddy used to be a drug dealer, an unfaithful man, a very hard man, very wicked lifestyle. But he came to church. Old James Langston, I think, was preaching. And he realized, man, I'm on my way to hell. And he trusted Christ as his Savior. Old Mr. Norris. And he'd get up there. He couldn't carry a tune in the bucket. But, man, he'd get up there and just belt it out for Christ. He is an alcoholic before he got saved. I remember him canoeing down the river singing, Jesus loves me, this I know. It had been raining for about two full days. We're canoeing down that river, camping out. He's saying, beautiful weather we're having, isn't it, boys? For the Bible tell. What was he doing? Praising God and didn't care what anybody thought. Hey, you feel overwhelmed? Then just stop. Get along with Christ. Call out to him. Ask him to lead you. He will if you let him. Ask him to protect you. He will if you let him. And then just praise him. Just praise him. We used to sing a song. I think it was old Dan Haltry, an evangelist. First time I ever heard it sung. He'd sing, it's amazing what praising can do. Hallelujah, hallelujah. I said, I don't worry when things go wrong. Jesus fills my heart with a song. And he says, even when things go wrong, I'm just going to praise him. How about are you overwhelmed? Get up right next to Christ. He'll protect you. He'll lead you. Everybody bow your head and close your eyes, please.